welcome to a brand new episode of Hocus Focus. I'm Sarah Mondaini. And I'm Thomas Sheridan with the Hocus Focus baseball cap. And it's great to be back. And before we get started, I'd just like to say really about the weekend, how much I really enjoyed the Mysterious Earth Conference. And Neil MacDonald, as always, put on a great weekend with some great speakers. And I bought loads of books and no doubt I'm going to end up reviewing them all. I met loads of very interesting people and it was so nice to meet so many people who watched this show and I just want to give just a few shout outs in particular to Sebastian for his recommendation of a short story called Ringing the Changes by Robert Aikman and you can find that on YouTube if you want to listen and it's very very eerie and very very creepy and that's all I'm going to say. And also to our friend Lewis, who drove all the way up from County Cork, just to say hello. It was really nice to meet you, Lewis. And I absolutely adored the smooth Cork accent that was like butter. And Yanina and Grant, who I haven't seen properly for 10 years, that was lovely too. That's more mutual friends that we've got there, Thomas. And Eamon for the gin, the gin and tonics and a good laugh. And finally, to my friends Till and Val for driving to the venue and just for making the weekend really fun and one other thing um, now somebody put this gift in my bag this necklace here and this this ring and um, I didn't find that till I got home now I have a feeling I know who it was but I can't be 100% certain but I do want you to know that if you're watching tonight it was a lovely surprise and really appreciated and it's very me so thank you for that very much appreciated and thanks to all of you out there as well for all your patience with us while we got back on schedule with our show yeah i'd like to reiterate all that i had a wonderful time even though i was working i really couldn't get over the quality of the discussions and the events and i'd like to do shout outs to uh Eamon and sebastian for their wonderful company to james uh and his mother i got this i got to meet james's mom uh, finally and uh, gosh everyone else you all know who you are and uh, so uh, yes and wow it was just a fantastic I came away buzzed the only reason uh, I couldn't uh, buy on any books is because of uh, you know luggage allowance but uh, the books stalls were not only full of the most amazing stuff but also were really inexpensive I was shocked at like books that I thought were like re real rare stuff going for a few quid here and there but we had a great night uh, in the in the pub uh, where the jimmy savile suite i stayed in was in and uh yeah it was brilliant absolutely brilliant and uh the film was received really well and uh i, I hate saying this because i feel like we look if i left i left you out you know it's because i'm <laughs> my brain is like full it's not because you've been left you've, you've been snubbed so uh thanks again everybody and let's get back on to tonight. Um, our first topic tonight actually uh, is one of my favourite old school Fortean mysteries. And it's the Bermuda Triangle, which is an area of sea situated between Miami and Bermuda and Puerto Rico. And it's famous for those vanishing ships, disappearing aircraft and all kinds of high strangeness, such as the navigational instruments failing, UFO sightings, strange glowing mists, time slips and even the possibility of other dimensions and as I said this is one of my favorite old school mysteries and it was Charles Belitz's book that introduced me to the Bermuda Triangle when I was a young girl and I remember watching the accompanying documentary to that book and it was one weekend when I was around eight or nine and I was a bit young to really understand the book but I did get to watch that documentary staying at my grandparents' house. And I was both fascinated and terrified at the same time as to what these strange occurrences, what these like reconstructions of these strange occurrences were um, and what they could actually be. And I don't know if, did you see that as you, when you was a little boy, Thomas, or well, you'd have been a bit older than me? No, it came on my radar a lot later. I remember the BBC did have a documentary series called Horizon that ran for years. And they did a thing on the Bermuda Triangle. I didn't even know what the Bermuda Triangle was. And it was not so it was it was around the same time the the, the, the film came out and the book came out. 
and I they kind of it was it was kind of debunking you know they, they well they showed how what could have happened to flight 19 and so on but no I thought it was quite frightening actually and quite interesting mm. and um then I got that book the famous you know the, the Charles Bless book and uh honest to God now it was of, of all my 40 and interest it was way down the list as I felt that it w- it was on dodgy ground. It was a huge area, an area known for hurricanes and seas and just an enormous amount of shipping and aircraft traffic. And so I, I put it to I put it to bed for years and years and years. And then years later, I, I looked at it again and it was the flight logs of the recorded from the air traffic control in Miami, I think it was, or, or Florida, Key West, one of those areas of the Flight 19 crew, and it was unbelievably strange. And then I started Then I started to think, maybe there is something to this, especially when I found out the Bimini Road, which is, you know, which which Edgar Casey said were predicted would be found as a, a remnant of Atlantis. It was near Bermuda, right in the middle of it. And there was, inter- I saw another documentary, and I think it was on, it was an American TV show one that wasn't a, it was an independent one. And they were interviewing people that knew the waters really well. And they were talking about strange mists and where things do happen. And it's not just things like methane from the ocean floor bubbling up and sinking ships. That planes finally, you know, it's almost like a, a gigantic ferry strain. They're in the wrong place in navigation. So then I started to take it really interestingly and seriously again to the point now where I definitely do think there's something going on there. I definitely do. And uh, it's definitely now further up my league table of 14 interests. Well, the area is known as, um, they call it scientifically, a vile vortex, which is an anomalous place where events and objects don't behave as they normally would. And there are several of these vile vortices around the earth and another well-known one is um the devil sea which is southeast of japan and the bermuda triangles actually got other names as well kind of nicknames it's been nicknamed the murky mantle of death which is quite a good one or the jinx and i just want to mention a few instances that have occurred within the triangle and one that intrigued me the most was um just to continue on from our previous episode last time where we briefly touched on Flight 19. I just want to bring that story in, go into it a bit more. Because on the 5th of December, 1945, there was a senior flight instructor um, called Charles Taylor of the USS Marine Corps. And on that day, he had a strange gut feeling that took over him and he didn't want to take the flight that was scheduled for that day. And um, despite his plea to be relieved, he was refused and he was ordered by his superiors that, to proceed with the flight. And there was another man also due on the routine flight exercise, and that was Lieutenant Charles Cosner. And he also had a kind of eerie reluctance to take this to the skies that day, but he managed to escape the fate of Flight 19 because his request to be relieved from duty was honoured. And once the planes were in the air, the communication system between the planes were full of the pilots all kind of talking all at once, saying that the instruments were going haywire, um, giving off erratic navigational readings and, and some kind of an eerie haze had enveloped them all. And the radio transmissions were kind of broken, but they were of the men talking in some kind of a straight of Um, some kind of a state of disorientation and confusion and they said that there was a blinding light full of colours which was like some kind of crazy rainbow and amid all this going on one of the pilots said over the radio to um, to the ground don't come after us and then he was mumbling something about a vehicle above them from outer, outer space and officials put the disappearance of flight 19 and its rescue plane down to faulty instruments and navigational errors. But that raises a really deep question. Well, how could an entire fleet across different planes all succumb to the same technical malfunctions simultaneously? And even the skeptics 
of this point out that that is very, very, very unlikely for that to happen. So with Taylor's premonition and Lieutenant Cosner's adamant refusal to fly that day, and then you've got the really strange radio transmissions and the vivid descriptions of an otherworldly craft, they all just seem to create more questions than answers. And the planes, I don't know how many were in the fleet, was it five? Yeah. Five planes, all the crew and the rescue mission, they all disappeared without a trace. Yep. And an interesting aside to that is that Flight 19 featured in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In the opening scene, the aircraft it's um, found in the, the aircraft are all found in the desert in immaculate condition, and the fuel tanks are full. And then it appears again at the end of the film, where the crew return to Earth from the mothership, and they're all the same age as when they disappeared. And alongside that, there's another incident I just want to quickly mention here, and that was Flight 403, which began as a routine flight as well. And they were almost home when the co-pilot noticed that the sky had developed a strange haze, and then the radio started crackling and they lost communication with ground control. Now, on the ground, all the ground control people were in a panic as the aeroplane had simply just vanished into thin air off the radar. But on the plane, all the crew and passengers' watches and sense of time had all gone a bit warped. And the watches above, above the aircraft and all the instruments of precision said it was 12 minutes past 12. And when the mist cleared and they were reconnected with ground control, it was as though the aircraft had come out from some kind of hidden vortex and everything returned to normal. And after landing, the crew were met by a very upset and quite angry ground control and emergency services. And while the crew's watches and the passengers' watches now said 1236, the world outside the aircraft said it was 1246, so they were 10 minutes late. So where had they gone? And what had caused that 10 minute gap from their flow of time? And there are many theories to that and some are rational, such as blue holes and subterranean vortices and sea quakes. And while some of the disappearances have since been rationally explained, many of them haven't. And one of my own favorite possibilities is, and I think it could refer to flight 403, is that time doesn't always move in a straight line and parts of it can break off from the main flow and take with it whatever might be in the area at the time so the vessels and the occupants would be transported to the future or the past or could even be trapped in a parallel universe until it corrects itself again the thing with flight 19 is that the initial the bunking or, you know, the official explanation of the BBC put forward and others was that the planes had travelled e uh, east out from Miami. They were to go to, I think, the Bahamas, do a short uh, pretend bomb run and then go back. And what happened was they went out to the Bahamas and took the wrong turn and went further out to the ocean. So instead of coming back to Florida, so they eventually ran out of fuel and ditched out here. Now, now, there's a few things in that. One of the transmissions said that the sky and the sea don't make sense or they're the wrong colour. Now, this again, they said, like the story in Australia last week, was that the planes were probably flying up down, upside down by mistake. Now, I can understand maybe one plane flying upside down, but not a whole squadron. And also the same thing with the failure of the instruments. The same navigational equipment and compasses are on each plane. It's not like the... The squadron leader is the only one who has the tech, you know, the gear. And secondly, they were, you know, planes were back then gravity, gra gravity uh, filled, you know, gravity fed fluid fuel. So if you turned them upside down, within a matter of like seconds, they would have all fallen out of the sky with the propellers off. So that isn't true either. So Flight 19 is a really strange story the more you think about it. Especially the more he tried the bunker. We're not talking about, you know, people didn't know how to fly. These were like professional airmen. And, you know, some of them had like quite long hours in the sky flying the latest aircraft. So they weren't like flying like, you know, rubbish or anything like that. Now, what's even weird about that is that the 
a rescue plane was sent out and that also vanished. A big one. I think it was actually, it's a refueling aircraft or a marine patrol aircraft that could go out quite far and that just disappeared off the face of the earth. Now, there was a story that some fishermen had reported seeing a flash in the sky and they claimed it will probably explode it. But that doesn't make, you know, one guy makes sees a flash in the sky. That could be a, an, anything, a meteor. Any, it could be anything, you know. It could be the sun reflecting off a, a highly, you know, back then, a lot of planes were polished with stainless steel aluminium bodies. So they, they used to reflect the, the light, you know, huge distances like a mirror. So it could have been that. And there was also the early stuff, the pre-20th century stuff. There were numerous records in the British Ad Admiralty of a ship sailing between England and the uh, West Indies passing through these areas. And they would report similar things that the wind wouldn't blow for days. And the and the, the, the compasses were pointing in the wrong direction. That there was often a mist was seen that couldn't be explained. And there were strange lights that would be under the sea and also in the sky. Now, I, even Christopher Columbus's San, uh, San, Santa Maria log even reported a strange place in that area that they, they refer to as like, a, you know, the devil's ocean or something like that. And so it goes on. You know, it's 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 one thing to you know what you know it was, you could say like oh well they're just day trippers on boats who get missing and they make mistakes and they they get into squalls and storms and they're not but we're talking about able seamen we're talking about like you know fellows who were sailing ships of the British Empire when it was the, the Royal Navy ruled the sea as real Britannia ruled the waves these these guys had seen everything as well as Columbus who was a you know an able seaman as well. So it just seems to me that you wouldn't have so many professionals on top of their field either going missing or reporting these anomalies. You know, they would be all amateurs or, you know, some with a small fishing boat. And that's another thing I find interesting. There's more stories concerning large vessels than there is small ones. And that could be interesting too. I know that a lot of them um, have been put down to the whirlpools i forget the technical name for it but there's some kind of subterranean caves underneath the sea that go right down into the earth's crust and then when as the the tide and, and whatnot shifts in and out it does create large vortexes. whirlpools but yeah, yeah vortexes and yes I, I, that's that's been accounted for some of the disappearances it doesn't certainly doesn't um account for the airplanes and, and vortexes and vortex, sorry, that the, the sink ships are theoretical. They're not, you know, factual, as is the large methane released from the bottom of the sea. There's been I don't I'm not aware of anything they can point to or anyone saw that happening. It's just been a way to describe mysterious sinkings. The idea that like if the vortex, the vortexes are still theoretical in terms of bringing down a ship, as is the methane. Now I know when the methane goes up. It, methane gas is far less buoyancy than oxygen in the water. So what the thing is that the, the ship loses buoyancy and falls down. But that's still theoretical as well. You know, that's still not, you know, cast iron proven either. And we know about the, the sea earthquakes as well. We know that there's been ships that have fallen victim to that. Not all of the disappearances, mind, but some of them. But like the sea, the sea quakes don't answer what happened to flight 19 or flight 403 or all the other flights that ran into difficulty um when flying over that area there's definitely like, an anomaly there yeah i would like to take the i would like to take the baseball bat and hit the hit the thing into the world into out into the ble the bleachers of high strangeness a bit further what if the same technological forces that destroyed Atlantis are still trapped down there under the sea. Now we, you know, we hear these stories that there was a, you know, you know, Casey did say that traces would be found of Atlantis off the Bahamas. Absolutely was, you know, uh, right where he said it would be. And he also said that through his predictions that, you know, there was two f sort of like cultures on the island who one was an a scientific, a scientism type culture and the other one was a spiritual culture. And they messed with technologies and went too far that caused this the city, the, the, the continent to fall beneath the ocean. You know, let's 
let's as we are a 40 and show we have to look at this too is it possible that the actual technology technology that destroyed atlantis is still down there under the sea in the same way you might have you know you spent nuclear fuel in a cave or something that ruptures and gets out i do like that theory that edgar casey put forward um and about the, the i think it was called the dial stone which was something that would shoot out lasers and or some kind of i think they call it a death ray um and apparently that's supposed to still be under there lying at the bottom of the ocean and every now and again it um, emits a force or a ray it's still going off every now and again and that is what causes some of the disappearances allegedly yeah, and it's actually wrecks reality around the area. Hence what happened to Flight 19, not really understanding where they were, disorientated, and other things. I mean, to me, some of the stories from the British Admiralty of the ships in absolute stillness, they almost gave the impression that they were outside reality, the way they talk about it. It wasn't just a case of the wind not blowing. It was like everything was still. They didn't see a bird. It did nothing happen. There was nothing just them in a sea of blue. I I think um, it's possible, or I like to believe it's possible that for some of them, they've gone through through a door into another reality, just temporarily. That there's some kind of opening there, and they've gone through there. So, I think in the Bermuda Triangle, if that was to happen there, and they've gone through some kind of time warp or, um. I don't know, anti-gravity anti tunnel or something like that, and they've found themselves, they're not in this reality anymore. They could well, watching the movie uh, uh, Opperman, the recent film that came out, I really had no idea how central uh, quantum theory was to the development of the atomic bomb. It was central to the Ma Manhattan Project. And why, you know, Opper Opperman and people like Niels Bohr were very much beginning their real hardcore experiments. Now, the Flight 19 thing wasn't too far away from that in time-wise. So could have been that, like, the Manhattan Project or something similar had, you know, in the same way 9-11 had fractured reality and caused these things to happen. Yeah, and again, is it the military involved again? Is it something, something to do with the military, like yeah, with the USS course. Eldridge? I just thought of something else in the in uh, I never thought about it in the mix. It wasn't. It was around the same time, and we have. I, I I just just popped in my head now. So if I'm off, I apologize. Remember how L. Ron Hubbard and Sarah Northrup stole Jack Parsons' money. What they were doing was they were buying. They said they were claiming they were going to buy sailboats, and sell them in, in, in L.A., sail them through the Pamanac Canal and sell them at a high profit in Florida. Uh, they were actually robbing Parsons of his money. And Parsons did an, a magical working to cause mayhem in where, where their boat was in Florida. So you wonder if that was even, a, I mean, I, I know, I know it's, it's, it's after World War II. It's a similar period. I don't know when. But there's something that we can look into. Them. You know, you never know. It might, it might bear fruit. A little bit like um, the magical working that Crowley did up in Scotland, which kind of we believe brought the, the Loch Ness monster into being, because it, it's yeah. got that's partic that's got trapped in this dimension, kind of. You could say it's a spiritual maybe being. Parsons, yeah, maybe Parsons working. Reign reignited uh, and it did work because they were nearly killed the Coast Guard had to rescue them Sarah Northrup and uh, L. Ron Hubbard so yeah you know that's definitely something like and then we're not far either from like you know it's a strange part of the world as well you know that whole area down in Florida and stuff like that and the, the, the Puerto Rico and stuff of that area you know there is a lot of um witchery and stuff in that part of the world cuba puerto rico dominican republic and all that area 
There's a, a ship, I think, that went missing. I was reading about it, but I don't have enough information to go too deep into it. But it was called the Witchcraft, and that was from that area. And the ship was named the Witchcraft, and that ran into difficulties while it was in there as well. And that led to the belief that there might be witchcraft involved. Yeah, I'm just thinking that's a great idea for a movie that uh, Parsons is, is hexing Trump and, uh, sorry, Aaron Hubbard and Sarah Northrup and accidentally switches on the Bermuda Triangle. That's Atlantis power. Some of the Netflix will steal this idea now, but you know, go ahead, it's yours. <laughs> Yeah, it would make a good one. Yeah, with a dial stone at the bottom and um Oh, you could throw so many big He who controls the dial stone controls the world. Yeah. R- Crowley writing letters back saying you all your unfinished ritual Parsons has co- released the behemoth from the ocean, you know. And then <laughs> Well yeah, well I definitely do believe there's something to the to be a triangle now. For a long time I was skeptical about it. Well I wasn't the dismissive of it but it wasn't on my radar now it firmly is and i want to know more about it same um and like i say a lot of the ships that went missing have been explained but a lot of them are still open and um the military don't like you asking questions about them and don't wish to answer the questions and and one man even got shot at his desk who'd um run into trouble in the triangle in his airplane and he got he um he said he felt like uh, he's, he's he's in this book. I'll have to get his name out. I'll put it across on the ticker when I do the edit. It'd be might... while you're looking, it'd be interesting to to wonder if there's a a Flor a Floridian version of the Montauk project operating down there. You know, we hear a lot about the Montauk thing in Long Island. It'd be interesting to see, what, to see if there was some kind of black ops. Was operating around Miami or you know Fort Lauderdale yeah. or the or the Florida Keys. I'm sure people who live down there would have a better knowledge of the area. It take me ages to find this, but just just give you a, a, an overview of it, and I'll put the name in the ticker at the bottom of the of the um the screen. He was flying; he had his own plane. He was flying through there, and he hit some trouble, and he said that he felt like the ship had been taken over by another force and he didn't think he was going to get out of there alive and he saw lots of strange lights and uh, a green mist all around the plane and as quickly as um, it appeared, it disappeared and all the instruments went back to normal, everything went back to normal and he was a bit like ourselves, he was very fortian minded so he didn't want to let it be and he made it his life's work to go and find out what the hell was going on in there and he did a lot of research apparently he got quite close and he was asking questions at the military and one particular night he was at his desk doing his research and um somebody got in through the window and shot him through the head good grief so and we don't know who or why or or what the reason was for that but it put a stop to his to his research into the bermuda triangle it also has a kind of a the name of a Bermuda Triangle. It has this kind of sort of like you know gravitas. It's there's something. It was very like talk. Yeah, mm. but do, do you remember? Yeah, that's a great it's a great artwork. That very very Omni, remember Omni magazine, very Omni magazine artwork. The the the, the Charles Burritts one was uh, It looked like a movie poster, the cover of the paperback. That was literally everywhere when I was a kid. It was all over. You saw it in every like second-hand bookshop, and it was a huge success in the day. I want that one. I don't. I have Charles Bellitzi's book on Atlantis, but I haven't picked up the Bermuda Triangle one. I was looking for that over the weekend, and that's when I found this one. I picked that up at the Mysterious Earth. But um, yeah, the the Charles Bellitz one. I used to have it. Is that one any good? Yes, it is. It's not bad at all. It goes through every single case from the 1400s with um what's he what's he called um christopher columbus all the way up to i mean bear in mind this book's 1972 so it goes all the way up. oh it's all the, the berlitz one then yeah up to from the 1400s to october 1973 this covers 
So they're all in there. Yeah. yeah. And it, it tells you at the end of each one whether it's been solved or whether it's still open. Oh, so it's almost like an encyclopedia. Yeah. So that's our um, discussion on the Bermuda Triangle. And as always, we'd be interested to hear your thoughts and theories on that. And if anybody's watching who lives in Florida or, or in that general area, yeah. are you aware of a Montauk research facility that might be over there in the area? A anything that you could um, that you know about or that you could throw light onto or even your own thoughts and feelings, please put them in the comments for us to read and for everybody else to read so we can share ideas and throw them around. Because as we always say, until we have a definite answer to what's going on, all possibilities stay on the table. Our film review this week is something different from our usual style and I've got to thank Thomas for suggesting this film. It is a beautiful Irish film about folklore and family ties and it's the 1994 film The Secret of Rowan Inish starring John Lynch and Killian Byrne. Now, there are two sorts of things going on with this film for me. The story itself and the beauty of the locations around Ulster on the west coast of Ireland. And the film is about a young girl called Fiona who's sent to live with her grandparents in a small coastal village after her mother died. And her grandfather tells her these amazing stories about the history of the family. And she learns about the Selkies and her own family's connection with them. And Fiona learns from an older distant cousin, Tyg, about an ancestor who had married a beautiful Selkie and they'd had a happy marriage and lots and lots of children, but there was always a strange bond to the ocean. And he tells Fiona that the Selkie's blood is in their own family tree and how that once in every generation, there's what's known as a dark one in the family. And just like him and Fiona's baby brother, Jamie, he was taken away by the sea, almost like the sea had stolen him when he was in his carry cot. So Fiona goes on kind of an adventure or a mission, if you like, to uncover the truth about uh, the family's connection to the Selkies. And then alongside that story, there's another kind of story arc about the landlord selling her grandparents home. So they're going to have to leave their beloved home by the sea and find somewhere else to live. And Fiona and another cousin called Eamon get this idea that if they move to the island of Roninish, um, which is actually Gaelic for the island of seals, then the Selkies might give them back her little brother. And so you've got Fiona and Eamon taking steps to secretly clean up the family's row of cottages on the island in the hopes that the grandparents will move onto the island of seals. Now, this film had me crying throughout a lot of it. Not in a sad way, but it was such a heartwarming film and it took you right back to real island, not the island that we've been currently seeing in the media. And it was pure family and folklore just surrounding this really close-knit family and seeing all that stunning scenery and the music and everything about it just, just gave me this longing to go back there. And I think for me, one of the real chokers was to see all the seals and how they looked, how they looked after that little boy and made sure he was safe. And these Selkies were literally the in-laws for this family, or as Tyg put it, another branch of the family. And the innocence of the children portrayed in the film and the love of the family, um, both human and Selkie side, just took you right back to simpler times and it makes you feel really nostalgic i won't spoil it by telling you what happens but the final scenes are just magical and if you watch this film honestly there won't be a dry a dry eye in the house and you'll have the most wonderful warm glow around you and this renewed hope for getting us back to a traditional old world it's a film that's just so full of genuine human emotion actually getting a bit choked up thinking about it it's just so relatable and it's perhaps even 
what's lacking in today's world and it just makes watching this film a wonderful emotional experience and I've watched it twice since we, de we decided to review it and I am going to watch it again so not so much a folklore horror but more of a family folklore film yeah I think that's what makes it perfect is that you can show this film to everyone to, from kids to adults and they'll all love it and it does have you know it's kind of like dark side like when Jamie's little 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 sea crib gets knocked out to sea, and there's there's plenty of scenes that are kind of dark, like when Fiona goes into the mist, and uh, that is kind of spooky. The scene where this woman emerges from the seal skin is absolutely brilliantly done. It's a uh, it's it just looks so real, and uh, I loved John Lynch's character as Tig. I love that scene in the place where they're. That they're opening the oysters, the four lads. And she go, Fiona goes in, and he, he gives her the story, and it's like it's very masculine or something. The way that he's cutting over, he's cutting up. He's, I could imagine all the women feel madly loving him. He's he's cutting over oysters with a big knife, and he's gone. Let me tell you about the other side of the family and stabbing on the table. It's very very kind of cool and manly, and he's almost like a rock star fisherman or something, and he's a brilliant actor, and. Uh, the whole cast. I love the character played by the grandmother. Uh, she says, oh, it's, you know, they, they have like grandfather talking about, and he's a very famous actor in Ireland. He was, he's dead now. And he was talking about, you know, all this, the, 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 I haven't seen it. And she goes, it's just superstitious nonsense. Don't be putting that stuff into a child's head. It, and then she does a ritual by the, she does a ritual by the fireplace uh, just to Bridget. You know, it's like, it, it, that's that's amazing about it, but they sh it, the way they're bonded to the island, they can't leave. You know, you can see that they, their nature, they belong there. And uh, the young lad, Eamon, you know, he's honest about it. You know, he's honest about it. I'm going to go back to the island. I'm, you know, he couldn't, they went to work in some factory in the city somewhere and he couldn't deal with it. And uh, it, they showed how like her father, okay, he had a breakdown after his wife died. But he's fallen apart in city life. He can't deal with it. And, you know, things like, you know, depression and alcoholism sets in. And it just goes to show you that you you are bonded to kind of to the land of your ancestors. Now, that film was made by John Singleton, who's an American director, who's more known for gritty American social commentaries like higher learning. And then he comes to Ireland and makes a film <laughs> like that's just absolutely magical. The soundtrack is brilliant. The acting and the casting is brilliant. And what I can't get over is how they got the seals to act, to do those scenes. You know, like when they're, chase, and you're cha chasing Jamie back on into onto the beach and he has to go home. And that little girl, Fiona, she was like a she was like a fairy come to life. It was it's it's absolutely a perfect film. It, it really is, you know, it, it, I, I, I can't, I, why it's not no one more not more well known is beyond me. Because I think in terms of any kind of the genre of a folklore family film, I haven't seen one better. No, it's a magical film. It really is. I don't know what the um what the age thing was on it, if it was a PG or whether it was a a 12 or or what. I don't know. But it was magical. It really was. It, it, just, it didn't have the push behind it. It didn't have a big studio. You know, it's an Irish film. It didn't have like a big Hollywood studio behind it to push it and that kind of thing. Uh, so that was a lot to do with it. Although I did see it in America. And it, it even there, it didn't, you know, I thought it was going to really take off. It didn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you know, I can't, there's not one thing in that film I can find, I can fault. Like I've thought about it, like, uh, you know, is there anything in the secret of Rowan Inish that I think is not good or didn't work? Nothing. It's all perfect. Yeah. It's absolute. And even the way the grandfather tells the stories, it's so believable and real. When he talks about, like, you know, his, his her father meeting his her mother who's now dead, and the way he describes the story, you know, and she wasn't a worldly girl. You know, that's how people that aren't really did talk when I was growing. You know, a little kid. You know. There, you know, and uh, I, 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 it's like to me that was like a, an incredibly difficult movie to make. The way they had to use the sea, 
the way the locations, you know, and then to get the seals to act and perform in the story. And they were, you know, that that, that scene where Fiona's, Fiona's first coming in and the seal looks, sucks the rock and follows her like this. I know you. She's back. Jesus, that's amazing. That's an amazing scene. That, at that point, that, that scene alone is like, is like one of the most greatest scenes I've ever seen in a film. And yet the whole film is full of scenes like that. Yeah. It, and yeah, and he did, like you say, he didn't have a big, a big glitzy production, but he didn't need it because it had the beauty of the seals and it had the beauty of the, that backdrop of, uh, I think, was it Ulster? It's County Donegal. It, right. It's, yeah, it is Ulster, but it's in the, the Republic of Ireland. And and the music as well against that backdrop, everything, it was just, everything worked. It was, didn't need to be glitzy and glamorous and loud. And it, it was just, when he started telling the stories to her at the dinner table, I'm thinking, oh, he's going to start again with the story. What's next? You really felt like you were sat at that table listening to him. Well, they were starting again after World War Two because they kept saying the, the, the government had evacuated them from the Isle of during the war. Uh, which happened a lot, and that, that, that those a lot of the islands in in Ireland, the government used the World War Two as an excuse to evacuate them, because they said they'd be in danger, and then they never went back. It was almost like a sinister thing to get them onto the mainland because it was, you know, they did want to provide expensive services over out to the islands and stuff. Right. But yeah, uh, there was that kind of thing too. Uh, but you really felt you were back in those days. I could smell the tour fire. I could taste the cakes that the mother was making, Granny mother was making. It was just, you know, it, it, the film was a labour of love, but yet you don't hear much about John Singleton talking about it or anything. But he always, the, you know, you, you unleashed some magic, some cinematic magic when you made that film. And it's 30 years old, that film now, but uh, you don't see, even though it's set kind of in old oh. times almost, you don't see it as being 30 years old. Look the the cinematography and the colours and everything on it because they're already kind of in period dress anyway aren't they because it's quite an old-fashioned village that they're in we're all in yeah. traditional dress anyway i think the story of the book was set in 1946 or something like that just yeah. after world war ii you just get this longing you want to go back there you just want to go back to those simple times where it was all about fishing and telling stories and having a cup of tea and a piece of grandma's cake making your own butter and that kind of thing. Yeah. And it showed that like even though it was during World War Two, they'd all survived fine just by living off the the land. You know, and the father was even saying, You want to see the amount of milk that the cows produced on Rowan Inish. And the chickens laid three times as many eggs. You know, they, it just goes to show you that if you, it, it it was almost like the island had created a reality for the Keneally family to be on. Yes, like the island didn't want them to leave. No, no, and the seals were kind of like, uh, rem you know, reminding them that this constantly. Because I think if I remember rightly, the grandparents, they were going to have to leave that house. There was a possibility they might have to go onto the mainland or into the cities. And the, the, the grandmother said, there's no way the grandfather's going to survive that because his life is by the sea. He's always lived by the sea. But they didn't want to go or consider going to the um, Rowan Inish because of what happened with Jamie. the little boy, with Jamie, when he got taken away on the sea. And also Fiona's but, mother dying. Yes. Yeah, but the way these two these two young children just took it on themselves to go over there and do up the cottages and, and get help and, and surprise the grandparents. Look, look what we've done for you. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. Perfect movie. So if you want a, if a, a folk happy cinema, but it's got lots of mythology and it's got lots of magic in it. So don't, you know, it's not just, it's it's not just your average kind of like uh, story. Lots of human emotion in there as well. It's quite, um, it's quite an emotional film, but happy as well. Dark in places like Thomas says, but also kind of happy, happy feel good film as well. It's just a nice film. That's all I can say. And you, you remember the seal's eyes forever. Yes. Yes, because I, when I saw those seals, I actually said, oh, gosh, look at look at that. Look at that. 
because you couldn't believe how close up they got. And like you say, they were kind of almost like they were actors in the scene. They weren't just animals that were sat on, on the rocks. They were part of the scene. And that scene where uh, Fiona's on the beach at night screaming to the seals. She does he belong to people? He's, he's, he's just a little boy. He has to come back to people. That, that was an amazing scene. Was. Highly, highly recommended. Go and if you can find a copy, go and watch that. Fabulous. Yeah, and if you want to know someone's a psychopath, show them that film. And there isn't a tear in their eye at the end of it. Break all contact with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you don't cry at that, they haven't got a heart. They've got a swinging brick. <laughs> Well, it's been a couple of weeks. A lot has happened. It's a strange time, as you'll find out when I get to the psychic weather. But to prepare us for these strange times, here is Sarah with the psychic hygiene. For this week's Psychic Hygiene, I want you to think about letting the mental images of past authority figures in your own life fade away along with any hold they have on your inner world. So imagine this, there's no one but your higher self to answer to and you hold the key to your destiny. For this week's Psychic Hygiene, I want you to think about letting go of any chains of past authority figures that have been lingering around. Picture those figures from times gone by who breathed fear into your soul and made you doubt your own worth and in some cases even your sanity. Now visualise these figures one by one lined up before you and as you summon them see their power fading and their grip loosening and watch in your mind as you shrink them down into total insignificance then feel the weight of their disapproval and threats evaporate like early morning mist, and then see with clarity that these figments of the past hold no dominion over you whatsoever. You answer only to the gentle guidance of your own loving creator and your personal truth. Remember, only you are the architect of your reality, the sovereign of your destiny. So realise this moment of empowerment because it's you and only you who has the authority to shape your life in alignment with your heart's desire. So as this wave function continues to collapse, and more and more people inevitably start to reveal their true intentions. Now is the time to reclaim your power over yourself and don't give it to anyone. And that's my psychic hygiene tip for this week. Funny you mentioned that. I've been thinking that about that kind of thing a lot lately. I guess it's kind of like psychic anarchy. You know, you, you have no rulers of your psyche because, yeah, it's true. I mean, I think, you know, as we kind of enter this kind of free for all uh, stage, that the hat to be grabbing onto someone is a drowning man kind of thing. You've got to like have all your psychological, emotional, spiritual faculties intact. And secure and grounded within you, because uh, there's no guarantee you, you won't end up on your own. This, the, you know, and, and, and it seems to be an age, this is the age of the individual. What we've learned from 2020 is the individual thinker is the one who survived. It's like a friend of mine said to me once that the ones who survived the Titanic were the ones who didn't stand in line and wait for instructions, they just ran to the boats. It, that's, been, that's been what it's like since 2020, hasn't it? Yeah. So yeah, a great psychic weather that that's uh, yeah, psychic anarchy. That's that's what that is. And uh no psychic rulers over your own spiritual and psychological dominion. No. No. Nope. And that goes it's... for people in authority in on the on the world stage, people in yeah. your workplace, people in your life, people just people in general who think that they can lord it over you and 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 think that they've got the 
the authority over what you should be doing and thinking. Cut them out. You see, the thing with us pagans is we don't have a personal relationship with a god. We may have gods that we have an affinity with, but we don't have this thing of like us, you know, we can petition a particular god for help. Well, not for help, but for like, you know, assistance or something. Like it's, a, it's a difficult thing, but we don't have this thing of like the Abrahamic thing of praying for a God and waiting for God to give you an answer. Uh, the gods, their gods move in mysterious ways. And they, they even though they, they look out for us, they're not going to personally service you in your life. That's one of the beautiful things about paganism is you're not waiting for a salvation. You're saving yourself all the time. And our second topic tonight is the subject of portals, portals that lead from one reality or one place or one space-time event into another. Now, there's loads of ways of looking at this, and most of my engagement with this issue is through things like megaliths and ancient sites, where there's all kinds of stories that if you go into one passage mound in one part of Ireland, and you bang a stone, it can actually be heard in another passage mound miles away as if it's transmitting through the ground. But there's also other stories that they'll, you can actually, in the old days, people would go to these passage mounds and actually end up in another one miles away. Now, this happened also in a cave, oh, in the Gat, not far from here, where it's supposed to be connected 40 miles to a cave of Kesh in Sligo. And... I'm now thinking that what the old stories about you could walk from that cave to the other wasn't so much by means of a subterranean passage now blocked up, but you could actually be transported like a kind of a, a portal, like the the bridge, like the uh, the transporter on the Enterprise to the other caves, and we see these kinds of things everywhere, and it may be that there are kind of openings in reality that allow you to jump from one place to another, one reality to another. And this may explain people suddenly find themselves back in time in a different age. Now, there's also the possibility that military and governments have been working on these things as well. We've seen the film Stargate. And there was a there was the gateway process that was done back in the early 80s using the Monroe Institute things of the idea of transforming space time for, for people in the military to actually go into other realities. And this was done by means of a torsion field. And the gateway process was taken very seriously by the military and the CIA. And it's ironic that they were slagging off information that they gained from the Monroe Institute. And here they were using it later on. So there's there's definitely a high level interest in see when as soon as the upper echelon takes an interest in it, that says to me there's something to it. You know, there's something to it. You know, like SETI. SETI was supposed to contract extraterrestrials. And what they probably discovered was there is nothing out there. And that's why they shut it down because they probably realize they're actually around us in a different dimension. And and funny enough, the, the, the gateway process document does kind of allude to this as well. Now, the portal, what would it be like a wormhole in space-time when you really think about it? And you travel through this wormhole between dimensions. Now, this might expl explain how uh, the, the Dogon tribe of Western Africa had advanced knowledge of the Sirius star system, uh, knowing it was a binary star and this exact precise elliptical orbit. They may well have, through some of their shamanic practices, found a way to go and actually see the thing. You know, if we're ever going to travel into space, it'll be through something like this, or consciousness flying through wormholes or something like that. It won't, won't be in nuts and bolts spaceships, and it won't be our, our flesh bodies because they can handle it going past the moon. So the portal thing could also be the fairy stray, something like that. The portal thing could be, you know, this, this there's a megalith near here where it's 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 in a roundabout. It's called Abbey Quarterstone Circle. 
And in the old days, people used to talk about walking up their roundabout to go to the shop and coming out the side, this kind of thing. And missing time events may also be connected to these kind of portals and wormholes. So it's a very complex and big subject. It covers a lot of different things. It, you know, you can take it from megaliths all the way to the Philadelphia experiment. And, and lots of things that we've covered over the, the year or so of this show it could be applied to portals, everything from the fairy tray to the Philadelphia experiment, lots of other things, uh, disappearing planes, everything else. So the portal thing is an enormous subject, uh, but it's basically been put to bed by the movie Stargate that kind of got the enormous to believe that it's, it's, it's some kind of machine the military has. And that's the only aspect to it. But I think that the, the portal thing, there's a reality to it. There's too many stories of people either going back to a different time, in a different place, something like that. And there are other strange experiences that are associated with it, like their ears would start ringing before it happened and other things. There's also things like bilocationalism that could also be covered by it. Like I said, we, we spoke about that with Padre Pio. So it goes to show you that how big this subject is. Portalings, portals, portal openings, rips in space-time, uh, transporters between one concept of reality, universe, and the other. So what do you think, Sarah? Well, it got me thinking, because a portal is a door, yeah? And with a door, you usually have things on both sides of it. So if you wander through a door unexpectedly, then both sides of the door are going to be shocked or surprised when you show up through the door, yeah? You're surprised, how did I get here? They're surprised, who are you? So perhaps the openings between our dimension, when they're accidentally crossed by us, be it in the air or on the waves or however it might be, in a fairy stray, at a megalith, whatever, could it be that beings existing on the other side of the portal have their own high strangeness areas in their own realms in the very same space as ours which would be just as unfamiliar and puzzling to them and so the sightings of ufos or time travelers beings entities things like that that have baffled us could be glimpses of interdimensional entities who are just as bewildered and disoriented as we are about how they got here, as we are about how they arrived here. So what we interpret as their unidentified flying objects could be on their side of the door, just simply their own conventional aircraft that have inadvertently slipped through the threshold between these two worlds. And just as we're sat here talking about mysteries, and the mysteries of their appearances, they too might have their own similar shows on that side of the door that discuss the weirdness of our unexpected appearances and who we are within their own dimension. Well, this brings us to your thing about uh, these beings was being resolved by our nervous system into a way we try to understand them. So maybe when you come through these portals, you're not like, you know, a fully resolved person or anything. This might explain like Sam, the Sandown Clown thing. You know, that's always, I think you're right, you're bang on about that, that the kids saw the BBC test card clown. And they, that's because they, they had to recognize something like it. It would also explain the, the concept of fairies. You know, that fairies are all, and there's lots of stories of fairies as being surprised to see people as people have to see them. You know, and it also might even explain animals that suddenly appear fully fully rendered out of nowhere where they should like there's this, a certain type of deer that was never seen before in an area should be seen or the black cats thing that you get all over in england you know they, they could even they could even explain them they could even explain that kind of thing i i think there's definitely you know the fact that the the military went to the levels of investigating this possibility shows that they took it very seriously themselves that they were they they didn't stay didn't see us there so there had to have been things anomalies like with the gateway process project there had to be anomalies that they 14 events that they must have studied or heard about or the monroe institute studied or heard about 
that they picked up on it saying, can we actually replicate that experience? Can we actually, you know, the game, even the earlier subject of the, uh, the uh, Bermuda Triangle, did Flight 19 go through a wormhole? Is this why the flames have never been found? I did read about the military having operate uh, the weapons to open up portals. I don't know if it was the gateway process, but I did read that they have got the technology to open them for a few microseconds. And they started that research in the 1960s on paper. They knew how to do it on paper. They didn't know how to do it in reality. And then by the 1980s, they were trying it out um, by firing argon, argon gas into whatever it was and then eventually they used nukes to open up these portals for more than a few seconds but they didn't know when the time portal opened they didn't know if it was the past or the future or if it was everything at once because everything became distorted and um it, it reality just didn't seem real it was distorted and buzzing and moving funny and it makes you wonder with it, with regards to flight nineteen and all the other all the other things in uh, the the Bermuda Triangle, are they still using this technology? Is that what CERN's all about? Is that why we keep slipping from one timeline to another and experiencing um, the Mandela effects and nostalgia for things that we don't understand? The uh, they have done experiments with subatomic particles where they banished them into a different reality. They just, they opened up something and got like, you know, a proton or something and banished it into another reality. And that, that's been done at the, the quantum level, which shows that it's possible at the, the bigger level. Now, I was just thinking there about, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, back to the subject of megaliths, the roll right stone circle, which is a very, very strange c c series of circles in England near the Cotswolds. And the New Scientist magazine did a, a research thing there in the early 80s and discovered that there seems to be kind of like a vortex that runs from stone to stone and spirals into the, the middle of the, the circle and vanishes out of reality. Now that would tie in with the whole story of these megalithic sites were used as portals by ancient people to move from one place to another. Something Nigel Neal did in Quatermass 4, where they brought the late people to the were harvested through the portals of the stone circles. It got me thinking, and I was glad, I think it was Neil Rushton said at the event that the, the Rollwood Circle is a very sinister place and has a very, a very strange, unpleasant feeling about it. And and that's that's definitely that's definitely uh, the feeling I got when I was there, and uh, that the, the, this was not like a you know this was not like a regular stone circle. There was some there was some real kind of heavy energy about it, which I didn't find pleasant in any way. And this, it's this interesting folklore surrounding it about it's about like a king who and his soldiers who were cursed by a witch and banished out of this reality. And they they can be brought back if the course is lift. Now that sounds like someone going through a portal, you know, and they're trying to get them back, you know, this kind of a thing. So there's like the folk, you know, and folklore is very multifaceted and deep when you start talking about it. There's, you know, it, 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 theoretically we know it's possible at the quantum level. We know there's enough stories out there to validate at least in a 40 in sense that it's people have had these strange experiences and we also have the fairies appearing and stuff and that that kind of thing but one more you know one you know it, 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 that you could discount but the whole thing of the military being involved in it you do wonder if they've already done it you know they've already done something you know, like they could you know they when you sign over for the military you're an animal basically and you can do whatever they want with you and you do wonder if they've actually sent someone through these things. I know that the Brookhaven National Laboratories on Long Island, are, they do some very strange experiments there. In fact, a lot of the Montauk project was actually transferred over to there. And that's basically like as high security as you can get. And and, and a lot of the UFO experiences that I've had, like I, I had a very strange UFO experience recently. Now, I've only had two in my life, and it's the second one. 
and I didn't have them until I was in my 50s. So what I saw was, I was looking aside the road, a top of portals now, and what looked like a silver, a pear made of metallic silver, it was the shape of a pear made of a metallic silver, appeared, moved for about 10 feet along the hedgerow and vanished. So it came in and out of this reality. Now, what was that thing? You know, it, it was it was nothing I'd never seen before, like a, a pear, you know, and it, it, it moved fairly fast too and was gone. And this is this is like one of the, the things that shows you that reality is not this solid thing. And, uh, you, you know, you always think of a UFO as being a big thing or a, a size of a spaceship. This thing was a tiny thing. It was on, but the size of a pear, right? a little bit bigger maybe. Sort of a grapefruit, but shaped like a pear. So the only, the only, other than me having a hallucination, which I wasn't, because you know, you know, I don't have hallucinations like that unless I'm actually doing something, and I haven't done that in a long time. That was a portal. That was a portal opening. Something came through, and then it left. And uh, it was actually the beginning of all the weirdness that's kicking in now. You know, it's it's it was like. I wouldn't be like I said, I wouldn't be surprised. Now, you know, we talk about the strangest of the time, and I said in the psychic weather that there was expect something to come. Well, portals are opening when you think about it. When you think about the portals are opening and potentials and experiences and elements and so on, aspects that we hadn't previously seen are now manifesting everywhere. Which seems very strange. You have thought you think of being in Liverpool and so on. You know, we think of portals. Again, back to that movie, Stargate, it has everyone thinking it has to be a military machine, but they could be very part of natural, the natural order of things. And as this wave function collapses and this version of reality becomes less stable, I think we're going to see a lot more of these things pairing and vanishing. I saw something similar to that. It wasn't a pair, though, and it wasn't recently. It was a, a silver ball. And I was looking out the bedroom window. I'd actually opened the curtains in that one morning and I watched a silver ball float past my window very, very slowly. It was right there. And I, and I wasn't imagining it. I wasn't hallucinating. And that just went by and then it just poof, gone. How big was it? Like a tennis ball. Yeah, what I saw about the size of grapefruit, but it was definitely shaped like a pear. This was a ball. but I, I, was, I was struck by the highly metallic surface of it. A highly, a very, very almost otherworldly metallic sheen off it. Like it was almost liquid. Yeah, like mercury. Yes, yeah, same, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, I have no idea what it was. Very wasn't interesting, from, yeah. Wasn't when from was around that? here. When? Uh, about five years ago, that. But it's yeah. always stuck with me because I just watched it. It just came out of nowhere, appeared. Went right past my bedroom window, and when it got to the other side of the window, it just like it went gone. That's what this thing did. It just switched up, like a switch had been flicked, flicked, and it went off. Yeah, flick, so, switch off, switch off. So that that's a portal. That's something coming in through a portal, and then out of a portal. You know, that's that's what that is. That's something coming in and out of it. And I think you know. Uh, to me, it's that 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 shows a spectacular possibility of other realities and other things out there, all operating in the same space. And did it did it come through by accident? Did it wonder where it was? Yeah, you, you know, know like... and the and the Bigfoot film. I talk about how Bigfoot is kind of like that, and you you know you know one of the things that Bigfoot researchers that i'm convinced that the bigfoot thing is a, is a fairy type situation it's not an animal uh, there's loads of reasons for that one of the most famous one of the most obvious reasons is the footprints disappear they will walk for a certain distance and be gone well, what does that tell you it's got the thing has gone into another reality you know it's, it's switched on and off and there's certain like I, I, on that bigfoot film i have a graphic to show how it's it switches in and out of reality and, you know, we perceive it in our reality. And so, you know, this is another thing, too. They've used, you know, the whole Bigfoot thing. They talk, You know, there's a small element of looking for a spiritual thing. I'm, a, I'm convinced it's a fairy-type experience. 
just like the Native Americans said it was. And, you know, the, the fact that people shot bullets at it and they went through it and things like this. And, it, you know, the footprints, they, you know, there's, lo- there's so much hoaxing, hoaxing and all kind of other kind of fakery and the whole Bigfoot thing. But there are things that are undeniable. Like you do see these footprints that just vanish, you know, they're gone. They're in the snow. They're not like, they're not like they went through a river. They walk and they're gone, you know. And there's loads of stories that, and on photographs over the years of people taking photographs of the snow and be like, where'd the person go? Mm. Where'd the person go? The footprints just stop. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of stories of disappearing children where the, the footprints had walked and then just stopped yeah. as if the child had been taken, you know, or, or went down at that point. Is, is it a portal? Is it a time warp? Yeah, there was something weird about the John Bennett Ramsey, that little girl model, sort of child beauty queen in America that was found murdered yes. uh, back in the 90s, I think it was, that the footprints, one of the reasons they were not able to prosecute the the, the family or anyone in the household is that this set of footprints or something just magically started appearing in the snow and walking towards the house. Wow. Yeah. And that 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 kind of weird. Uh, in those series of books, it, it happened to me that fourteen times published of let readers letters. That's a very common one that shows up in, in now and again, like footprints that just appear in the middle of nowhere, and then they're gone. They stop in the middle of nowhere, like no one came to them and no one came after them. They just phew, gone. They arrived here, walked a few paces, and vanished. That that actually reminds me of a couple of incidents. Not not the footprints in the snow, but the, the vanishing of um, a couple of accounts that Tom Sleeman gave. But it was in regards to time slips, and he gave an account of um, one on Rodney Street in Liverpool, and in two thousand and nine. So these are quite recent insofar as falling in and out of timelines. It was a man called Alistair in 2009 and he was walking along the street when all of a sudden all the cars vanished on the road just disappeared and beneath his feet the road was cobbled and he said there was um, a multicolored light and a distortion in the atmosphere and then the cars all reappeared but they started going backwards for a while and then everything returned back to normal again and it was like, like nothing, a, ha- nothing happened. Like a tape loop was re- re- rewind or something. Yeah. That's a that's a really weird one. Something happened to me when I was about 17. I was taking a bus home. And my, par- was, my parents were living in West Dublin at that time. And it was Christmas time. And it was snowing in the mountains. And they live at the bottom of the mountains. And I didn't fall asleep. Because I, I I, 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 I'm, I'm still kind of an insomniac. I have this weird thing. I can't sleep, and I can't sleep that well. I'm getting better at it now, but I, I, when I was younger, I was absolutely an insomniac, and so I didn't fall asleep on the bus. And I'm looking out the window, and then the next thing I know, I'm ten miles down the road in the mountains on the bus, with nothing in between, like in the blink of an eye. And I didn't faint. I didn't fall asleep. I didn't pass out, and it was like. What should have took 20 minutes to happen in a second? Uh, and I'd missed my bus stop, yeah, and was way, way down past where I needed to get off. See, so that's where you stayed. It didn't go back to normal. It was just one minute you were there, it was somewhere, and the next minute you were. No, it didn't know. go back to where I started off. It could just the, the main, the direct. It would be perfectly explained by me falling asleep and dozing off and waking up. But that that's that wasn't my style, you know. Anyone who's known me most of my life will tell you that I have I've had tremendous difficulties. So there's something about my serotonin level system, and um, I I have other I have other issues too from that that I can just fall asleep very easily in the daytime. It's almost like a form of narcolepsy, uh, and then for like five minutes, and that's my sleep done for twenty four hours. It's really weird, you know. So it's like, but when I was younger, I was just like sleeping for me was extremely difficult. Oh, well, like not just younger, like most of my life, you know. So that I was, I definitely did nod off. The concept of nodding off to me when I was a teenager 
was impossible because by my 30s, I still could nod off. That didn't happen to me. And, you know, I was just you're full of energy when you're younger. So that was, that was like one second I was where I should be on the trip. And the next section, 20 minutes of the journey was missing and I was somewhere else in a split second. And I, I, I was looking down, I was looking down like this. And then I, I looked out the window and said, where, where is this? Where the hell am I? And it was all the mountains, all the mountains are covered in snow. Where, where am I? Where is this place? You know, and that was like looking down and then looking up. So I didn't fall asleep. It was just, I was reading a magazine or a book or something. So Did you notice weird... anything weird with your watch or anything or the time? Had the time passed by I, normal on the I clock? I didn't have a watch. And I went down to the bus driver and said, I think I missed my stop. And he said, well, I'm going to fall asleep. I says, yeah, he says, this bus has gone back. You'll be okay. Don't worry about it. So I just stayed on the same bus. But it was weird. And and also, yeah, it's just, and it was also a surreal experience because the the countryside was covered in snow and the hills and the mountains are covered in snow, which they never, and that's, snow's quite rare in Ireland. And that alone was kind of surreal. It was almost like, Every you know the, the the strangeness of the weather had triggered a shift in my perception of reality or something like that. Very strange. Mm. Very very strange. No, it, um, wasn't, it wasn't disturbing or anything. It was just weird. You know, it's just like what the hell? What the hell? Well, where did you go? Where did yeah, you go yeah. for the whatever time? Whatever time it should have been to get where That's you. Been, it was at least twenty minutes missing. Gone. Where did you go for 20 minutes? You must have, you know what I mean? Did you disappear off that bus or was it just your consciousness that went somewhere else? Well, it's funny because it's like, it's an amusing thing. I remember years later, you know, yeah, when Ali G, you know, Ali G used to, that show with Ali G in the house and he was interviewing some guy from NASA and he goes, um, he goes, I, I believe in alien abduction because he says, my mate Dave, my, my mate Dave was on the stains to egg and bus and suddenly he he was in Egham and then he was in Staines. How do you explain that? And that and that was his joke, you know, like it was a joke thing he was doing. But that's exactly what happened to me. You know, <laughs> you know <laughs> and there I was watching the years later Ali G telling a joke about something that actually happened to me. It does make does make you wonder where you went. Did the whole bus go or was it just it was very quiet. It was like one of the late night buses, and it was around Christmas time. There wasn't many people traveling back then. Right. Uh, yeah, it's just strange one, all right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I can remember like the bus driver was like, you know, well, you missed your stop. Yeah, I must have. Did you fall asleep? I said, I can't remember falling asleep. He said, I'll take you back. We're going back anyway. And, and a very surreal feeling during the whole thing. Not like scary or anything nasty, actually, quite pleasant in some ways. A beautiful countryside lit by the moon and the snow lit by the moon, blue by the this countryside blue. But yeah, it was just weird. It was just like I was switched, like 50, 20 minutes was missing from my life. And I came back and on a, on a moving bus is a strange one. You wouldn't expect to happen on a moving bus, but it did. Oh, can't explain that one at all. Wow. So it's like space time just collapsed and 20 minutes was lost or something like that. But what's weird about this one is that many people who have the experience of these missing time experiences find themselves quite upset by it, yes. find themselves quite disoriented by it. I was almost very accepting of it. It was just weird, mm. but it didn't bother me in any way. It didn't upset me. It didn't freak me out, but it was just, it was like, oh, oh that's interesting. That, that was the bad. I was saying, well, that's interesting. That was the kind of reaction I had. There's um, another time slip um, incident here from Tom Sleeman um, in 1996, this on Ball Street, and an off-police, an off-duty policeman called Frank was shopping with his wife on Saturday afternoon, and he went, he went to buy some records, and she went to buy some books. So they split up, and he went one way, and she went onto Ball Street on a book to a bookstore called Dylan's Bookstore. And after a while, he went to meet her at Dylan's bookstore. And when he got there, he walked through down onto the street and he said he was back in the 1950s and the street was no longer pedestrianised and it was all quiet 
and all the shops had changed, the fashions had changed, everything. And the bookstore that he was stood in front of earlier was now a clothes shop called Crips. And there was also a van that drove past, a 1950-style van with the name Kaplan's, Kaplan's and Son on the side. And then he saw a girl dressed from the 1990s. So he felt a bit better because he realised he wasn't the only one from his time who was here in this space. And this girl who was dressed from the 90s as well, she went into the shop, which was now the clothes shop. So he followed her because he knew she was from his time. And then everything went back to normal when they got inside the shop and it was 1996 again. So the policeman tapped the girl on the shoulder and said, did you, did you just see that? Did Are you aware of what's just happened? And she said, yeah, I thought that was weird because I thought it was a new clothes shop that we was walking past. And when I went inside, it was a bookshop. And she couldn't understand it. And she walked off scratching her head saying, I don't don't know what that was. And afterwards, um, he went into the history of the shops on Bold Street in the 40s and 50s. And there was a shop named Crips in the 50s and the 60s in the same location as this Dylan's bookshop, which is now a Waterstones. And there was also a firm around the area called Kaplan's and Sons, which um, coincided with the name on the side of the van. So he slipped well, in. Well, I always find myself feeling kind of very floaty when I'm walking down Bolt Street. There's just something kind of otherworldly about it. Now, we've, we've sp I've spoken about this. There's one of the theories is that when they were digging the underground train line there, that they went through it, they found a gigantic quartz crystal, a massive quartz crystal. And that's actually what causes the effects in the Bolt Street area. Well, it's, it's weird. You're, you're stopping you're in your top, the top of Bowl Street, and you're looking down at this at the church. That's that has that it's just a shell. It was bombed in World War Two. Everything about it seems very strange. Now, before I was coming home last last week, I was wa traveling around Birmingham, uh, Birkenhead, on the other side of the river. And that train tunnel goes under the Mersey and comes out in Birkenhead, and. Jesus, Birkenhead is like ontology, ontology central. The streets are always empty. You know, it's just it's it's just very it's it's like going back to the nineteen fifties or something. It's like you know it hasn't changed. It hasn't. It, it's lost out on the, the the boom that Liverpool has had. But it's, that's what I loved about it. And it's just when you're walking around this, you know, the old Victorian architecture of old train buildings and dock buildings, there's something really trippy about Birkenhead as well, which is the other side of the river. So it's almost like, you know, Liverpool itself is like some kind of portal, the whole city. Well, the whole on both sides of the river, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because you said Neil Rushton had an experience there as well, didn't he, walking down? <laughs> Yeah, I think he lives on the other side, on that side too, the Cheshire side of the world. And uh, Anthony Peake grew up there, and he said he had loads of ex weird experiences growing up. But th that area, that 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 uh, Birkenhead itself, the fact that it's neglected and run down, it, and 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 the sun was setting. It was just this like, I I was I was like in this ontological dream state, walking around, and there never seems to be anybody in Birkenhead. Birkenhead. It always seems to be nobody there, and yeah, you know, and and the ferry comes in from Liverpool there, and it's like this, the 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 ship comes the 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 overnight ferries from ships come in from Dublin and and Belfast there, and yeah, with all the traffic in and out, the streets are just always kind of deserted. There's something beautiful about it. I, it'd be like a, a kind of a neat place to live, because it's and it's just this kind of. It, it is like a portal of a different time. Mm -hmm. And it's like that, you know, you'd it, 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 it have to experience it to, to you know, and, and what must have been like before they knocked down a lot, there was a lot of slums and tenements used to be there. It must have been a very interesting place to like live and grow up in. Especially with all the experiences that people have had there. Yeah, I bet they could tell some stories. And, but even the mythology of the ferry across the river, you know, the song Ferry Across the Mersey and stuff like that. But also that was almost like a kind of a, like this kind of river sticks thing going on, you know, like 
you transfer from one reality into another. It's a, it's a very it's a it's a very amazing city really in in, in that way. I, there's nowhere like it, you know. It's it, uh, but I I was quite taken back by how there's nowhere in Ireland that looks like what you know Birkenhead is and now like it's all moved on here. But I really did feel like I was back in the 1940s or something, and and felt that energy, you know, uh, especially with the streets being so deserted and it's run. It's not, I wouldn't say it's run down. It's just old, you know, most of it. It's just a fascinating. And then when you, if you come to the train, there's a train station that says frequent electric trains and an old sign across the Mersey. Um, it's now Mersey Rail, but it used to be some other rail company. And that's the one that goes to Bowl Street. It's almost like the energy from Bowl Street. You could feel it coming across the river into Birkenhead. And that ties up with like Tom, what, a lot of what Tom Sleeman's books are about. They're not just in Liverpool. They're also in the Wirral and the Cheshire side of the river. Yes, also it's all almost all interconnected. Yeah. That and, energy, and... like it washes in, it washes over and comes back again. But the river's like pitch black. When you fly in and into the airport, over the river, yeah. the river is black, deep, wide, and still. It's 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 it, you know you could you could actually believe there's some kind of little crafting creatures living down there in the mud. That's a, that's a whole topic in itself, Liverpool, isn't it? Yeah, and I even re recently heard from one of our mutual friends that uh, there's they won't admit it, but the reason why everything are moving to a new stadium is because they believe Goodison Park is cursed because Dixie Dean, their most famous player, died of a heart attack while attending a match as an older man. And they believe there's been a course on the club ever since. Right. And that place in Everton was a very old part of the city where all the the Irish famine people went. You know, the worst of the worst, the poorest of the poor escaping the Irish famine ended up in that hill. So, you know, it's just weird. The whole thing is weird. You know, it's just like that. Why, why put this one? Bald Street's like a, norm, a normal street, but yet it has like just about everybody who's walked down it has had a weird experience. We 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 talked about the Fortiana of John Lennon on the second episode, and um, I'm just trying to think back now. Um, did did oh, he have... ever talk about the strangeness of Liverpool? Well, true as music, he did. If you look at like Strawberry Fields, that's. But here's something for you. I made a quick video on BR313 while I was waiting to, to go to the conference of the Robin Hood stone, which is one of the Calder stones in Calder Stone Park, Stone Circle. And this is, I have to, I have to check it. But for, uh, it, it, is, it says the original site of this was on the Calder Stone Circles was whatever it was, 700 feet to the north of this line. And I think that was John Lennon's house. And if it wasn't John Lennon's house, it was Strawberry Field around the corner. On Menlo. All, it's uh, it's on Menlo Avenue, but the name of the the name of the neighborhood I can't forget it. Uh, but it's a uh, it's all the streets have names like Druid Road, Ash Road, Holly Road. It's all Druidic stuff, Druid Cross, all this stuff. So John Lennon grew up in a very mystical area, very mystical. Yeah, and uh, they wrote the song about Strawberry Fields, which, which is a very, very haunting song. Yeah, so there you go. It's like this guy must have experienced stuff when he was growing up, and then carried that to New York, where he was a big time fortian. Yeah. So he was, you know, he, he was kind of a child of the portal. So if you have any info on portals or what we're talking about, let us know because it's a gigantic and amazing subject. And at long last, we come to that time of the show again. It seems like it's been a long time coming, but let's see if we've got calm seas ahead or whether um, the Renfields are going to go off the, off, the, off the Beaufort scale. We've got Thomas with this week's Psychic Weather. This week's psychic weather is really because I haven't been out here for a couple of weeks. It's more like a psychic climate, psychic look back and look forward. It seems to be all happening right now. There's something very intense going on 
lots of people are reporting deja vu as I haven't had a deja vu in years, so I, it hasn't happened to me. But I'm lots of people posting on my social media and other stuff that are having tremendous deja vu's at the moment. Me and others, what I have been having with an off the scale synchronous synchronicities, I literally am thinking about something and it manifests uh, immediately right afterwards and in some form, in some wink from the universe. So synchronicities, and I'm not the only one, everyone, a lot of other people are reporting incredible synchronicities at the moment too. Now, uh, this is sort of like a psychic gust of wind that carries those of us who want to be taken along by it or moved, in, move, you know, moved along by it. It takes us along. And we use things like recognition of synchronicities in order to encourage that process but at the same time, too, there's an element of drag. And that means the more the, the psychic weather and the more sort of magic and things like that become available, it sets the rent fields and the, um, the the spiritual bottom feeders off. And they can't help themselves. They're totally impulsive. They're totally, uh, they're unable to help themselves. They can't control themselves. They've no stewardship over their psychic autonomy like Sarah was saying in the psychic hygiene report and they're the barometers for what's going on. And they all, it's, it's amazing and it's true, but they always flare up at the same time together. And I'm seeing it on the streets. I'm seeing it everywhere. And they all seem to have, you know, they, they're, they're not even really alive. Many of them, they're not, they're, they're not alive because if they were alive, they'd have a sense of self-reference. And they wouldn't, they would, you know, the whole thing is like spiritual development. You don't, you don't look beyond yourself for solutions. You know, it's all within. They're the complete opposite of Zen masters. Everything is, is validation through external ref, through external individuals, people, situations. So they're like, it's a vampiric thing that they can't, they can't generate energy with inside themselves. So they can only rent field or flare up in order to try and procure it from others. And they all flaring up at the same time. It's amazing. It's ama as is all the things at the same time. So what is this saying to us? That something is coming. Now, there was tremendous Northern Lights, Aurora Borealis in Northern Europe. I saw it myself yesterday. They were incredible. And, they were, and they, they're way too early in the year. They don't usually come around till after Christmas. And it, that was strange by itself. And uh, there was also sto stories of massive thunderstorms in North America and things like this. So the psychic weather is often mirrored by the Earth's geo-global weather and also the cosmic weather above. So I, I reckon we're going to, we're coming into a period of incredible change in reality. Uh, these kinds of things, the night before the Battle of Waterloo, there was Europe had its biggest ever thunderstorm. And uh, the night before the Third Reich annexed Austria, effectively st starting World War II, there was massive lights and all kinds of events that were seen in the sky above Europe. And we seem to be having a period like that now. Again, before 9 11 as well, there was an enormous thunderstorm over the New York metro area the night before. That was unusual for that time of year. It wasn't that hot. Now, so we seem to have this, something similar going on now. So I would just say to yourself, the story, psychic weather this week and it's, is like, you know, potentially, if I was to, this is the like the Las Vegas or the Atlantic City of psychic casinos, I'd say put your bets on the table of something massive coming down. It, it changes. There's some kind of great change coming. I'm not saying it's bad or good or anything. I'm just saying something's coming. Now, I'm noticing here, even in Ireland, on a local level, that a lot of the sacred cows have started collapsing one by one. So, in, and there were like people that were, in, and individuals that were untouchable not too long ago. So, there's, there's definitely some kind of momentous flux going on. And so, my attitude would be prepare yourself for anything. And that's psychic weather with me, Thomas Sheridan.
Yeah, so the 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 cha- the big changes that are coming, do you think it's something on a global level, on the world stage, or do you think it's... Oh, it has to be. These are like kind of like mega auguries, you know? And I'm seeing it all around the streets and everything, you know? I'm seeing it around, you know, the, the zombified public, you know, this kind of thing. And you could, I see this around all, all kinds of nut jobs, you know? And, in, and not too many online. I'm seeing it mostly in, in real life. And uh, it's just very strange. It's just there's an element of confusion and distortion. And the Renfielding is like uh, massive. I mean, it's like, you know, again, you see, there's something about to happen, right? And the Renfields know subconsciously, internally, that they don't have the psychic equipment within them to deal with this, you know? They, 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 the ship is going down. They don't have a life preserver. They don't have a rubber ring. They don't have a lifeboat. So they try to, the, the trailing man kind of thing kicks in uh, because everything we're in the rent field is, comes from externalization, uh, validation, you know, the, this kind of thing. Uh, they, it doesn't come from within. You know, the whole thing, if like, if you've got your shit together, you don't care about everyone else. Well, Renfields don't have any shit together inside them. And this is why they care about everyone else, you know, because they don't have it together. I mean, there's a, you know, the, you know the, I find that remarkable. There's a look out for people with personalities disorders, such as things like dissociative personality, where they have multiple personalities. They will be scrambling and hoping to uh, find a personality that gets them through this. Uh, cannabis psychotics will be particularly worth watching at the moment. Again, just watch these. Watch them as if they're a, th- a thermometer, or a, you know, a temperature gauge, or a wind, a wind, a weather vane. You know, they're just they're they're tools, and they are provide. The the gods provide these uh, Renfields as tools for the rest of us to help us with human level ovaries. And you get it in the workplace. You'll get it in your workplace. You'll get it in you know going to the supermarket, you, you will find them, you know, and, um, and some of the things, like some of the things here in the in arts is going on right now is amazing. Like p- p- the political establishment and the media establishment is falling apart here out, out of the blue overnight. Uh, it, it's like they cannot find it within them to actually find a way to survive. And you will find that in your job, you're dealing with people like that. And you will find that in this, in, every aspect so the the drowning man king thing kicks in they haven't done the spiritual work inside them they're scrambling for either external uh savers in terms of thinking like if it's like if the ship is the ship is going down they're blaming the iceberg while everyone else is getting into the boats they're too busy pointing the finger at the iceberg and also um you know it, 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 I mean, it's so funny. We didn't talk beforehand, but your psychic hygiene is ident is exactly what's needed. Uh, do the work inside. End of story. It's that simple. If you've done the inner work, what happens on out there is meaningless. I had a strange experience talking about everybody's been a bit zombified. Um, I told you I went for a walk on Saturday, and um, aside from getting lost. We, I'd gone for a walk and taken a path early on in the day and um, I wanted to see if there was a shortcut this way and there was a farmhouse at the end of this path and the public footpath seemed to stop at this farmhouse and I wanted to know if it carried on, if you could go through the property and pick it up again on the other side and there was a dog barking there so I didn't just want to walk through somebody's property without asking them. So I'm walking, I thought I'll be a rebel, I'll walk down to the front gates and I'll ask the owner because the owner had kind of had hold of the dog and there was a man stood there and I got to the gates and I said excuse me um does the public footpath pick up again over there behind your property and he had the dog in his hand and he's just staring at me expressionless not answering me looking right at me like Norman Bates and so I said and I thought okay has he not heard me so Hi, excuse me. Um, can I pick up the the path? Does it go? Can I get through here? Am I all right to go through, or is it private? Just staring at me, 
no no expression nothing and I thought that doesn't feel nice and all I could hear was Christian Morris's voice saying don't be a fucking NPC it's none of your business move <laughs> or something else there I'm wondering if there's an element of chaos magic here because you've described the experience at the beginning of the Borderlands where <laughs> they, you, you were talking about it here and defending that person uh, yeah, I think you said like they they, they were calling him a hill bit heck and a hillbilly, and now it's happened to you in real life. So there could be a sort of a you know a chaos kind of working on your behalf. Remember, as you're saying things now on this program, your your, your actual attenuation of your nervous system is very different. So you're speaking out into the rea- into a, a huge audience worldwide. So you have to sort of like be prepared for these things that you talk about, like happens to me all the time, manifesting into your life. So that's a very interesting thing. That's a very interesting i would say that's a manifestation on your behalf right there now you see and another synchronicity at the beginning of this thing you said are we in for calm seas well when i was sailing over to the the mysterious air conference overnight from belfast to liverpool my cabin had a window so i could look out the sea all night and uh, i woke up a few times during the night and got up out of the bunk bed and looked outside and the and then and then the sea was like a sheet of glass and the irish sea is not like that the irish sea is usually you know, it's always moving, turbulent. It was like a sheet of glass. It was spooky. So, you know, that was a real calm before the storm thing. And it was always like, almost like we went to that mysterious air conference as a kind of a boot camp to get us ready for the, the, the you know, we were, you know, the, all the speakers and everything were all like motivational speakers, almost indirectly getting us ready, getting us spiritually and psychically ready you know, I'm thinking about, you know, Greg Moffat's talk and you talk about the late, you know, the, the Equator Mass 4 and things like that. You know, I really do think a Equator Mass 4 type situation could be around the corner, especially with all this weird stuff with like, you know, Mexican UFO aliens and stuff like this. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm literally ready for anything at this point and it you know we we live in very very peculiar and strange times but i think they're only getting started i think we're going to be i think you know that, like don't think it's negative think of it's going to be it's going to be interesting that's the way you look at it i've I've not caught up about what's going on in mexico yet i've, I've caught a few posts and a few bits and bobs about it but i haven't read it yet so we've we got another situation going down with the um, little green men some famous UFOologist guy down there, like a kind of an Art Bell of Mexico. He's quite, I've seen him on TV shows before. He whipped out two aliens in the Mexican parliament that he said were a thousand years old and fossilized. They looked like they were made out of FEMO or plaster of Paris. It was ridiculous. And, uh, but the fact that he was even allowed into the, uh, the Mexican parliament to show these things and it was broadcast around the world. Again, these are auguries. These are things you have to watch. I, I I do believe I'm I'm kind of like jumping into this Christian Morris world now, by saying that the 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 establishment are imploding, you know the latest the latest variant was a complete failure for them, and they don't seem to be getting what they want, and uh, hey let let the magic unfold that's what I say. Yeah, because I remember before we we had the this two week um kind of break we were talking about the possibility of another lockdown and coming and and this coming and that coming and everybody was a bit up in arms about that and that just seems to have fell down like a damp squib it was almost like the normies didn't even register it was very peculiar it was like people i taught people i work with and know who i thought would be the first to like fall for it were like it was like they didn't even hear it on the news or it didn't enter their brains it's almost like they that 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 spell doesn't work anymore. That spell, so that's why I'm thinking like they're going to do. I don't, it's, it, but it'll be like, or, or else it'll happen by an accident or something. I don't know. I don't know, but it's like it's going to be bloody interesting, and I can't wait to document it here and focus, focus as it happens, because the, the the time will come in the history of this show where we will become like news reporters doing live broadcast over what's happening in the world. It's it's getting closer and closer to that. There's been some mass UFO sightings over Liverpool. I think it was last night or the night before. Everybody was seeing strange, bright, flashing lights. 
Um, they put it down. Well, they don't know what it was. Um, the, I think it was the Liverpool Echo was the one that was most contacted about it. And they got in touch with whoever it is, your, your contact with these things. And they were told that they didn't know what it was. It had nothing to do with thunder and lightning. We had terrible storms where I lived that night. Um, but the Met Office had said it was nothing to do with 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 the lightning because it couldn't. It was too far away, and there was no storms in the area in Liverpool. And Liverpool is kind of like the Bermuda Triangle, a mini version of the Bermuda Triangle itself. It's a uh, you know it's it's just like it's probably not as forty in place on Earth in many ways, and um, that's interesting because I was ta- I did a talk with Neil Rushton who was at the 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 event a few weeks ago and he told me that he was walking down along the Mersey and he heard this colossal ringing noise from the sky. Liverpool is a great place to like look into for weirdness because it always seems to start there first. So that's the psychic hygiene and the psychic weather combined almost as one. And uh, I think you got all the information you need there to make the next few months very interesting. Now it's that time where we share and review some of the books from our personal collection books that have both influenced and left a lasting impression on us, earning themselves a permanent spot on our bookshelves. And we hope that by sharing them with you, we can inspire you to discover more exciting books to add to your own collections. And my book this week is something a little bit different to the usual. And my book this week is actually The History of Art by H.W. Janssen. Not Fortean, but it is a book full of magic, which I'll explain as I review it. Now, first off, you get a look into the world of art across the ages, and that in and of itself makes it a great book for those who are interested in the personal insights of the artists and an appreciation of artistic progression throughout history. And over the years, this book has been the book that art students have used for their academic pursuits. But I don't use it for that. I never have. I use it as a coffee table reference into the heads of some of the great creatives and artists from early cavemen to modern times. And from the grandeur of those Renaissance masterpieces to the avant-garde experimentations of the 20th century, the book makes you really think about and appreciate the artistic timeline that's helped to shape our world and I really do enjoy learning and looking at its collection of artworks and it makes me think about things like the emotions and inspirations and ideas that have driven these creators across different cultures and ages and how different artistic styles can really tell us so much about the human experience when it's expressed through art and I chose this unusual book because recently my own artistic spirit's been reawakened from its summer break and I always look forward to getting into my hobby once again as the seasons start to change to the colder months and the darker nights so a flick through this book always encourages me to pick up a paintbrush instead of just thinking about it And I think the book is a really good way to indulge yourself in art without the pressure of scholarly kind of pursuits and the pretentiousness of all that. And it's a visual masterpiece and reminds you that creativity is a boundless and timeless pursuit where we can bring things down from the etheric and psychic realms into manifest in the physical. And art is a solid case of as above and so below if ever there was one so that's why i picked this book this week because it's full of as above so below magic there's a reason why they call magic the art in the old days also there are certain artistic movements that are very magical in aesthetic one of them would be the symbolist painters particularly the german ones uh, you have also the Pre-Raphaelites, I think, is a great element of magic to that as well. And uh, the American Regents paintings of the earliest 20th century. I'm a huge fan of Charles Burchfield and uh, Edward Hopper. There's something about them. There's something transcendental about their styles. Well, yeah, absolutely. That's a great, you know, that people have to remember that magic is also, it's, 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 it's not only a science of language, it's a science of visuals as well. 
and uh, even painters like uh, uh, Chagall. They seem like very simple paintings, but they're actually quite amazing. They also go very well with uh, uh, Bisheva Singer's novels of this kind of like Jewish mysticism in an almost kind of dreamlike form. Yeah, amazing. So, so that's that. My book's the 1995 edition. I mean, I'm sure there's been lots and lots of other editions since then. I just open it up somewhere, have a flick through it. I'll read it cover to cover. I just... It's just a good reference book. Well, and you also, something as well. They can also be very inspiring as well. That's another thing. They're like a, like a, like a tarot deck. They can be very inspiring and certain the creativity of. Yeah. Uh, my book this week is The Secret of the Magical Grimoires, the classical text of magical, the, the, te the classical text of magic deciphered by Aaron Letich or Letich. This thing is a, a very large paperback. And basically what it is, if those of you who've heard about like modern Western magical practice and need something like, it's like a cliff notes of it almost. This is the way to go. He, the foundation of Western magic is from the Middle Ages and by means of the Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism mainly. So you have the, the three great texts of that time what would they be by Agrippa? Would Agrippa's, Agrippa's occult philosophy would be uh, the Key of Solomon, uh, the Book of Abimelech, and the Lamedurin, Lemer, however it's pronounced. And he, he look, he, he deciphers them. He basically explains what they mean, why there's dietary elements to them, how sigils work, what a seal is, the invocation of of angelic beings. The, the mages oratory it's, I found that stuff very interesting when I first read this uh, there's also a, a, go, a good deciphering of John Dee's Enochian magic and but what really liked about this book it, it takes all that stuff and deciphers it for you but then it also compares it to pagan magical practice to show you that they come from similar roots now the, the, the occult foundation of the medieval period is really what goes right through to like this golden dawn, uh, the OTO the golden dawn and into Crowley's Thelema. So much of it comes through that. So um, if you if you've been you hear all these comments, all these 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 these, you know, you, like where to start, where to begin understanding what this magic is. This is where to do it. Okay, this will tell you about you know this is where it comes from. And this will decipher a lot of these texts in plain language. What do they mean? Very interesting things like, um, you know, a lot of the dietary things, they, they seem very, well, they will, will be coming from like a Jewish background. They're almost like kosher. But a certain parts of a ritual where you can't eat specific foods, uh, such as, you know, animal fats. And some people would eat, would be on these diets and do things like eat uh, ice cream. Which contains what gelatin, you know, and the, or anything, you know, and the, or eat sweets that have gelatin in them, and they've consumed an animal, and the ritual will be thrown into chaos or will just fail. So it's very interesting. There's lots of, you know, it's 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 kind of like, it's a kind of thing. Like I I, I hear so I read I I, see, I hear Lovecraft in my head, and the Necronomicon when I read this, but it's loaded with illustrations and. Uh, a lot of the Middle Ages, lots of things like, uh, I can't, it's not showing up good on the screen, but lots of things like how talismans, deciphers, magical codes, this kind of thing, squares, uh, lots of Hebrew stuff, the descriptions of the angel, the, the towel robe, how to put on the vestments, how to actually magically prepare. It's a, a lot of that stuff that I'm talking about here, like in my own book, Sorcery, what I pointed out was, this comes. These were written in a time when there wasn't as much energy available to the average person as there is today. So therefore, complex and theatrical rituals were needed in order to generate large amounts of energy. Where now, these days, you know, in the post chaos magic time, you can get it from a roller coaster, a rock concert. You can find the energy there. So, if you're interested in the roots of Western magic, 
uh, and want to learn about it from the beginning in an easy, approachable way. The Secrets of the Magical Grimoires by Aaron Letich. Letich. It's quite an expensive book, too. You can pick it up quite cheap, but it's uh, there it is. Recommended for those of you who want to know what the hell John D and the rest of them are doing and why. That's a very interesting book. Hmm. Have a look at that myself. I will put the links up in the descriptions for the affiliates for the, um, when people want to go through and buy it. You get a few pennies in the in the pot to put back into the channels. But yes, that's very interesting. Um, does it go into Crowley's works or? Yeah, it does it, well? It, see, it's it, a lot of be foundation for foundational. But yes, it, you know, it, it, it does. It, it, the, the section that I thought was the best was the stuff on uh, D's Enochian, um, Enochian magic. I found that really interesting. But for me, the payoff in this was how he actually showed this stuff has comparable comparable associates with pagan and folk magic. Right. So think of like, think of these magics the, and, and the, say things like the, the use of Hebrew and the use of, you know, biblical angels and so on. They think of it as a software rather than the only thing you can use. And back in the day, this was the only available software uh, because of prohibitions on magic in the Roman Empire, okay, uh, following the, the Edict of Milan and the conversion towards Christianity, all forms of magic were banned. So the entire canon of pagan Western magic was lost for a long time. A lot of it ended up in Persia, by the way. So you had the Jewish world and you had the, 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 the Islamic world in Iberia. A lot of this stuff was preserved in the Landerock area in southern France. In fact, the, the Kabbalah, as we know it today, came from there. And I was down in, in a place there with Neil not too long ago, where basically Nostradamus and all the rest of them came out of it. So the, 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 this is the Middle Ages in the south of France, the border with Spain, Pyrenees area, is where this Jewish st stuff became the software, the operating language for magic in the post-pagan era because everything had been basically outlawed by the, the Roman Empire, uh, well, the Vatican, as it became, up until that point. So the desire to find a complex magical tradition led to everybody in Europe descending upon this kind of stuff. And that's why, that that's the only reason we have... Uh, a, 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 Oh, well, not really. we don't use it anymore. But up until like the, the 20th century or the mid 20th century, why we used Jewish mysticism and magical language and magic ritual is because the pagan stuff had been lost. And he does a great service by linking it back to pagan stuff. Now we have a lot more, uh, there's been a lot more work done in classic Hellenic pagan and Roman pagan magic that's come to the surface. And uh, we have a better understanding of that now. A lot of documents have been deciphered. So if you wanted to actually go back and practice magic as it was in Roman times or Greek times, you can. But back then, at the time, this stuff was all came to the fore in the Middle Ages. This was all you had, the Jewish tradition. And even the, in the Islamic, the Iberian Caliphate, they used the Jewish tradition as well. You've got some great books, Thomas. I've... You would not believe the library I've built over my life. I can, I can. I watched a video of yours not long ago and you were stood in front of a bookcase and I was um, looking at the books while trying to see what was behind you thinking, bloody hell, that's only a fraction of the bookcase. That must go right up and right across. It goes into several rooms. I probably have the best occult library in Ireland, you know. <laughs> what can I say? I, I, I don't hang out the pub that much, so I buy occult books and read them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, same as me now. It's not anywhere near as extensive as your library, but um, it's big. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, very particular. I know what I like. I know what I'm into. I know what I like. Uh, so if I, if, I need, if I need information on a particular topic, I'll find it. Like the books in John 
Foster Forbes. I had to find out about him and I hunted all his books down and I probably I probably one of the few people that has probably nearly all his books because many of them are only and I got them really cheap. You just look around, you won't find them. You know, the, it's almost like when you want these books, the universe finds them for you and puts them on eight books or something like that for a tenner. Yeah. You know, the guy just, you know, and then no, no one wants it. It's not got any value. The guy doesn't know anything about it. But me looking for a John Foster Forbes book on giants, I find it. Have to have it and it's there. So it's like those, it's like those, um, those, what you call it, those stalls we saw at the Mysterious Air Conference. There was real gems on there. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you have to remember, we, we don't own these books. We're custodians. We're custodians. Someone will only be after us. I hope so. I hope when I go, my books aren't just going to end up put in the bin or um, thrown away. I hope they go to somebody who appreciates them. Even if they go to the charity shop, it's fine because they elect, they'll actually go on to someone else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But like we're fi I'm finding a lot of those now with the suddenly well, with the suddenly unexpected Liz, you'd find finding a lot of these gems in um the charity shops now. Yeah, it's amazing. So Bad for them, good for us. And there then you here go. we are hoovering them all up. Yep. Well yeah, I've I've actually got I've actually got a that's one of the things I've been doing the last few days. I'm building more bookshelves. Oh, do you build your own? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I'm pretty good, pretty handy with tools and stuff like that, and woodwork. So, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. Uh, they, they're they're great for two two things as well. They insulate the house from cold, and also, uh, if you're recording music, they act as great uh, sound mufflers. <laughs> <laughs> Same two thing. In one. Yeah. But everyone should have paperback books because. Digital is no use. I, you know, that that can be all changed or destroyed. You've got to have the hard copies. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I've got. I mean, I like. I've got a little old fashioned Kindle that's from about twelve years ago, and on there are just trashy novels, really escapism. You know, just things they don't really care. Just read them for the sake of reading them to escape. Not really my non fiction books. My non fiction books are all. All around me, yeah. Because you can put post-it notes in there and put little pencil markings in, and yeah. Oh, I, 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 the post-it note is king. Uh, that's my holy communion wafer. That's what that is. <laughs> all those books are all are all full of post-it notes and notes notations on them. Yeah. Do you like, do yeah. what I do? I don't know if you do the same when I first get a book. First of first of all, I read I randomly, it. I randomly pick the book up. So I another post on today. Yeah. When I get a new book, say that was my new book, I would read it for pleasure first. And then I go back and read it properly. And then I start making the notes and putting the note the post-it notes in then after this on the second reading. Yeah, I do it on the first reading because there's so many. I read so many books. I I, I probably won't. Get, I don't I'll be able to do a second reading. Right, right. And and, and you forget things. You, you actually forget things, you know. So it, it helps, you know. Well, it's that time again as we come to the end of another episode, and we hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Thank you for joining us and for letting us be part of your Sunday night strangeness. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and share us far and wide. And as I said before, links to any book recommendations will be in the description box. And if you choose to purchase through the links, then we may get a few pennies in the pot through the affiliate link. Um, what else? Yes, next next episode will be on my channel again, as Thomas is still quite busy with some speaking engagements and other program, other projects. So I'll be doing the production again next time. And don't forget, uh, thanks for everything. The usual thing, like, share, and subscribe. Ooh, shameless plug. We have merch. Link below. And uh, there's nothing else more to say except, Sarah, Sarah, what is the tarot card this week? Tarot of the week. I'll just show you my little tarot bag before I do it. Just see what you, you like that. 
A hair under the moon. I know where you got that. Glastonbury. Everybody says that. No, I got it from the artist direct. Oh, okay. Because in Glastonbury, the whole thing is the hair and the moon. Oh. Uh, yeah. No, I got it from the artist, Lisa Parker. I got it from a direct. I have a, a matching purse. And whenever I go into the shop, I get people saying, have you been to Glastonbury? No. <laughs> That's the huge thing there. Your hair's in the moon, yeah. Oh. Right. So this week's Tarot of the Week is the Eight of Pentacles. And the Eight of Pentacles shows a person diligently working at a bench with a sense of concentration and commitment. And the completed pentacles are neatly arranged and the person's attention to detail and the willingness to put the time and effort into their work are very clear within this card. And there's a city in the background and that's quite important because it emphasizes the idea that the man in the card has deliberately turned his back away from the distractions of the external world to concentrate on the task at hand. So, for example, the city could represent social events, entertainment and other activities that might divert your attention away from achieving your goal. So while your friends might be out enjoying leisure activities, you're investing in your future success. And this card stresses that it's important to maintain this level of dedication as your efforts will eventually pay off. Now, that might lead to some initial sacrifices, but it's necessary towards achieving your long-term goals. Now, in relationships, the Eight of Pentacles can indicate a period where you and your partner are investing time and energy into the relationship and it could involve improve, improving communication, understanding each other's needs, or even working together to build a shared future. The Eight of Pentacles is all about the value of hard work, dedication, and skill building. And just like the person in the image, you too may be in a time of focused effort and continuous improvement. Your commitment, intent, and willingness to put in the time needed will set the stage for future successes. And the card this week is recommending that you take on the mindset, <clears throat> the mindset of steady progress. Like the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. So be proud of your accomplishments so far, because it's the sum of these efforts that will bring you forward towards your finished goals. And to finish, the Eight of Pentacles is a reminder that self-improvement is a journey and not a destination. So embrace opportunities to learn, whether it be through formal education, the pages of a book, or through life experiences. Every step we take contributes to our overall development. It's a very closely connected card to the Three of Pentacles. It's a card associated with a craftsmanship, apprenticeship, uh, education, diligence, and commissions. And if you think, if you if you, put, if you look upon it with the three of pentacles, I think of the three of pentacles, with, along with this one, it's, it's, it's really about uh, one is the apprentice and one is now you're working. You know, so they, they're very good for if you're going into business, if you're planning for the future, if you're going back to educa adult education, if you're training in a new skill, very, very good cards for that. They're about uh, self-confidence, diligence, and concentration paying off big time down the road. Yeah, those initial sacrifices where you think, oh, I have to say yeah. no to everybody because I'm busy and I feel like um, I'm stuck in yeah. all the time working. It in the end it'll pay off and it's um, also a part of somebody who has a, is good at a hobby like crochet painting pottery and then turning it into a business yes yeah so if you, you already have the skill that you develop yourself i can do this i can do pottery i can do crochet i can make baby clothes that kind of thing now it's time to make that into a business so i've got to you know get my head together and turn something I have a passion for, an artistic gift for, into a business. 
It's a great card for that. Very, very positive card. Very, very positive card. Yeah, I mean, even, yeah, it's a very positive image as well. The man in there, yeah. he's working hard. Uh, bright colours. He's not working there at a job because he's got to go and do this job that he doesn't like. He's actually doing a, he's, he's doing what he loves. There. And the coin's going up like an accumulator. It's building yeah. wealth. Yeah. Good card. Yeah. Good night, everybody. See you on Sarah's channel again next week. Good night. And keep that high strangeness high. <laughs>